Welcome to GV247.TV, the Global Vision Channel. A non-profit web TV channel bringing biblical perspective to the world in which you live. Hello and welcome once again. A big thank you for joining us on The Weekend Show with my husband Stuart, myself Deborah Menelaws. As always, we have a big welcome for the many new viewers joining us from all around the world. It's yeah. amazing how many countries are now tuning in. So I don't want to sound like a broken record, but with new people joining, can I remind you to take time to start at episode one? Yeah. Yeah. Because that tells you uh, about GV27 yeah. and you can move on to other episodes, although we have been going for six months now. This is a 27th programme, but you might find it helpful just going back to the beginning. Yeah. And uh, this week we take a break from our Church Survival Guide series with Pastor David Nathan and Johnny Kane. And as promised last week, we'll be meeting up with John Mackay, the creation guy on the east coast of Scotland. But before we do that, here's the updates. Well, we've already heard from one of our reps called Marisa with an excellent subject to be discussed in our upcoming Christianity for Beginners channel. So if you have a subject you think that new or young Christians ought to know, please drop us a note. Mm. Now, it couldn't be easier. Just click the contact link below. But no, we don't know the timing of the rapture or the Lord's return. So don't bother asking us that one. Stuart. Well, we have a number of programmes coming in the following weeks. As promised, we'll be looking at music. Mm. A hot topic for many. Yeah. And the nativity, because of course, Jesus is the reason for the season. Yeah. So we'll be looking at a wide range of prophecies that foretold his birth, life, death, resurrection and his return. Mm -hmm. So don't miss that. Helping us illustrate that will be the film production... Oh. Yeah, the Jesus film, mm -hmm. uh, which we had formatted into a special outreach DVD for the UK, and it's available on our web shop. Much more on this in weeks to come. So without further ado, the crew here at GV247 rose at five in the morning, and we made our way up the coast of Fife to a sleepy little hamlet called King's Barns, where we met with Creation Research Director John Mackay in the search for fossils on the beach. G'day, 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 and welcome to a dull, cold winter's day on the east coast of Scotland. Now, on this very spot, 1,000 years ago, what do you think happened? Well, the answer, nothing that anybody bothered to record. Oh, the Danes had come and mostly gone, and by the time the Normans got here, a very long-lived family, the Money Pennies, would own much of the land. Oh, you thought that name was invented for James Bond's secretary. No, they're a real family. You can even trace them back to the 1100s. Oh, and the king had built his barns not far away, and my dad would grow up just outside of Edinburgh. I'm the creation guy, John Mackay, and welcome to some very important stuff that Brian Cox and David Attenborough hope you never come here to find out. It's to do with these stones are full of fossils. Now, we're going to fast forward quite a few centuries to when the King's Barns had been built up there, and this was a, a prosperous little town, and they needed to bring in coal and potatoes, so they built this harbour, and time and tide are kind to nobody, and look what's left of it. It's derelict, but the stones reveal that secret that Cox and Attenborough hope you never find out. But if you have a good close-up look at many of the stones, you'll see they've got fossils in them. Now, if you look at these stones, they're standing upright because the old theory was that standing stones were harder to knock over by the waves than the horizontal ones. It certainly doesn't seem to have worked here. Are stones? No, you don't need to go to university to learn words like that. These are old words. They're just practical words. A stone simply is something that's hard. But it's what's in these stones that actually is that secret that you and I need to know about. Have a look at some of these fossils. Fossils is an old word. The ancient Greeks invented it. F-O-S-S means whole. I-L refers to what's in it. So question, why would they dig up fossil stones to build a wall of? Well, practical trick number one. In the UK, you don't need to go digging very much. Just read the walls. It'll give you all the geology, the whole area around you, including this wall. Second principle, nobody carries rocks too far unless the rock's up there in the head. So these must come from nearby. So all of these fossils, oh, do you, do you believe they're shells? 
Of course you do. Real, why? They look like shells. It's so obvious to you and me, and I wonder what it means. Let's pursue this a bit further. Today we're going to play rock detectives and find out where the rocks came from, how did the fossils get in them, did they live here, did they die here, did they just get washed in here. Follow us as we have an exciting program in this kingdom of Fife. Now it's time to get cracking as we pay uh, rock detectives. Let's check what's inside the rocks. Finding fossils is a great way to give the kids an afternoon out, particularly if you associate with a bit of history. Oh, let me get my hammer out and show you what I mean. There we are, it's coming up. And look at the fossils that are in here. Now, these fossils are all black because the outside's turned to coal. But remember, there's a secret here that you and I need to know that the atheists of the world don't want you to come here and find out. Actually, there it is over there. Let me just put this one out on the road. Uh, can you spot something interesting about these two here? Um, have you noticed that they're actually preserved whole? They're three dimensions. Now, when you have a look at the horse star rushes in the world today, they're actually hollow. These are actually full of mud and sand and things like that, and they're perfectly preserved. So ponder, you're a detective. There's a body in the swamp. Um, how do you know how long it's been there? Was it dumped alive? Was it dumped dead? You and I are going to figure out the answer to these questions, but today about plants. Now, when you take the family fossil digging, not only will you get good exercise, or get rugged up if it's a cold day like this, but you'll actually have to remember a few safety rules. Remember rocks shatter and also only hit the rocks that have already broken off. Remember the ones we said, don't hit the whole rocks? You might get yourself into a little trouble if you do that. But hit the ones that are broken off because they're going to be destroyed anyway. And look at this fossil here that I managed to find just the other day when I was down here looking. Fabulously preserved. The three-dimensional outside even shows some spiny, thorny projections. It's a tassel fern, but a giant one. I grow them even in Australia, and they only grow about that high. But in the rocks also, they are gigantic. The evidence the world was a much superior climate here, oh, you heard the right word, climate change, a bit of a farce. It's happening all the time, and these plants grew in a much better climate than what we have here today. Ah, but we know it's what it is because it hasn't evolved it's actually gone downhill. In many parts of the world, it's even extinct. Tassel ferns, well preserved. Even the spiny leaves, spiky leaves are preserved too. Actually, think about that. You buried your late dead Uncle Fred a few years ago. If you went and dug him up, is he well preserved? Answer, not usually, because his body has fallen apart. So the only way you can preserve these in three dimensions, like this one is, or the ones at the first stop, and beautifully in detail, is if you bury them real quickly. Not time, but process. Rocks don't record time, because if they took a long time to make a fossil, there'd be none there. By now you will have noticed that many of the plants in this fossil bed are parallel, and others are stuffed in between. Some of them are really huge, and many of them are beautifully preserved. In fact, it's so obvious, these plants didn't grow here, they didn't slowly die, they didn't slowly get buried. This is a flood dump. They've all been washed in and then buried before they could go rotten. That's why they're beautifully preserved. I mean, there's a really big one here. It's actually pointing the way to the answer to the next question. Here's a flood dump, mostly consisting of plants, and yet in our harbour wall, many of the hard rocks had shells in them. Nobody carries rocks too far unless you're filthy rich. So let's try and find where the fossil shells came from and see what the picture ends up being. How did these rocks get here? Was it quickly? Was it slowly? And by the time we get up near this corner and head around it, it's very obvious the rocks are changing. In fact, there's layer after layer of different rocks. Or layer in Latin, strata. Some of you have stratified titles in your in your apartments, it just means layer upon layer. Old words, um, they used to just use Latin and Greek in university studies, and in fact, that's where we get the word geology from too. Oh, look at the rock layers, one sitting on top of the other. Look at the types of rocks. Oh, and look, here are some of the shelly rocks right here. 
We can't be too far away from where they're coming from. Why would you invent a word like geology? The answer's simple. It's the guy who was just over the border who thought of it in the 1300s, because down there near Durham, or in the Durham City Council, is proud of this guy. He's on their, their city website. You see, it was a bishop who invented the word. And bishops study theology. Theo means God, Logos means a word, but Durham's famous for coal and stuff like that. So they needed a word that said, rocks, a word about. Geo, the earth, Logos, a word. Simple don't you reckon? These guys had to make these words up. Oh, there's our layer. And, and look, it's just about the right thickness for making walls of anyway, and it's full of shells. Of course, there is one interesting question. Why would you call it limestone if it's not really green? Now, have you seen the beautiful Norman churches scattered all through this land? And you think, oh, wonderful Christianity. Actually, it was more of a political stamp. We are here, we run the place. But you want to build those beautiful towering churches? You need to be able to build and you need to be able to put the stones there and you need to be able to glue the stones together and there's the clue. You see, when the Romans left this country, the people in England, the people in Scotland, really never cottoned on to this stuff called cement. The Romans had it down to a fine art, but for the next 800 years or so, most places didn't have cement. The Normans got here, no cement makers, no fancy builders, no really big buildings that had been built since the Romans left. So they imported people who knew how to make cement from Holland, from Germany, and they were coming here to make stone that would glue other stones together. What's their old Germanic word for glue? Lim. What's the stone? They would take the stone, just hard stuff. Remember where we got that word from? They would take stone to make glue and they called it limestone. And you know what the British are like with words. Limestone finally became limestone. But lime, lime meaning green, came back with the Crusaders from the Middle East. They saw this beautiful Arabic tree with an Arabic name, green fruit, and that's lime. And it became characteristic of the UK, correct? Lime and limb became one word. The history of these words is sometimes a fascinating look into history, just as these rocks tell us the real history is not the one that Brian Cox and Alice Roberts and the BBC and the high school textbooks are actually getting you to swallow. Let's find out some more as we play rock detectives a bit further up the coast. We're now a little further north in this kingdom of five, and sandstone has taken over. Our sandstone, it's sand that's gone hard. And what's interesting is the glue that's holding it together is actually the same as the glue we use in cement today. It's got a natural cement made of lime, but it's also got something else interesting. Do you see these layers here? Do you see how there's cross layers? Now, technically, you can read about these in the textbooks. They're called cross beds. And what we have here is pieces of wood and plant material and pine needles, etc., that have turned to coal. They're nice and black, and they're along the layers in the cross bedding. That it reveals an interesting secret that everybody on the planet should know. Follow me to a better example. And around here is something a whole lot more exciting. Uh, well, it is to me, and it will be to you. Do you see these cross beds here? What's fascinating about these is you have layers of coal running through them, but the layers split. One goes up, the other comes down, and you can actually see the really black coaly formations of the plant pieces there. But look at the top one. Comes up through this layer, then away it goes, all the way up there. Now, do you remember in primary school, in, in elementary school, when they gave you a glass of water and they put sand and mud and, and polders in it, and you shook it up, and then the big pebbles settled down, then the sand, then the mud, and the teacher said, hey, that's how the rock layers form. Well, that'd be a great experiment if the world was a glass of water, but it isn't. You see, what's interesting about these, we can run experiments on trying to make copies of these, and here's what you discover. These things only form when the water is traveling sideways. In fact, if you're honest, the only time you know about water picking up mud and dead animals and leaves and carrying them anywhere is when the water's going sideways. Not one on top of the other, but from left to right. Ah, you see this coal seam here is going up and the same coal seam is splitting. Is that rock younger than this rock? Because over there, it's exactly the same age. I mean, think carefully. 
you have a shell washed in. One settles there, and another one settles there, and another one settles there. And you and I, the way we're taught to think is that the bottom ones are older than the top ones. Not so. The ones on the left are older than the ones on the right. And you say, well, surely over six inches or half a metre, it doesn't make much difference. That may be quite right. But you see, in the world, there are many places where these layers, these cross beds, are 20, 30, 50 foot thick, and you see them plunging down. So that rock down there and this rock up there, if they're on this layer, technically they're the same age. But if they're there and there, then they're actually, well, this one's younger, much younger than the one that's 50 feet below it. You and I need to have our minds open to see we've actually been lied to. Time doesn't make rocks, it's the right process. If you have the wrong process, you'll end up with a story about the wrong time. And all of those documentaries that tell you it takes millions of years to make fossils, wrong. Time doesn't make fossils, time destroys them. Actually, a process of burying them quickly. Now, all the evolutionist theories depend on having vast amounts of time preserving a vast amount of fossil evidence. But there's no time in the rocks. And there's no fossil record of evolution either. It's one of the weaknesses Charles Darwin actually noticed, and it's just as true today. Let's look at a fossil where time doesn't help it at all, but flood process does, and it's absolutely no use to the evolutionists whatsoever. What we're looking at is the remains of a vertical tree. Over the years, the tides and the storms have battered the rocks, and obviously it's been a lot taller, but this is what's been exposed just recently. Because the normal story about these is they grew in a swamp. They grew out of the swamps that made the coal. They grew slowly, they were in swamps, they got buried slowly and over vast amounts of time. But if you actually have a look at this tree, the outside of it's turned to coal. There is no coal under here at all. These trees are not sitting on any coal. They may be sitting on some mud and they're trapped in sand, but if you get close up and look at the edge, you'll be able to observe how we know this was buried real fast. Now these trees belong to the Lepidendrum group. Uh, sometimes they're huge. I mean, I've seen them 30, 40, 50 feet, even 30 meters, 100 feet tall, standing upright in the rocks. And there's no way they got buried slowly at all. I mean, just go down to a swamp and try and get anything buried slowly. Even if you try to bury yourself and make yourself into a fossil, you'll find you'll rot off at the ankles long before you're covered up. And the same is true for fossil trees that are standing upright. These are called polystrate because they're going through many layers. Giant lepidodendrons, even the Y shape that's still in the plants at the top of their stem is preserved magnificently in this specimen. One of the things you have to really get used to that you've been lied to so often is that the fossils and the rocks do not support millions of years of evolution and they never have. The fossils are all about flood deposition, which has covered up fossils so quickly that they're actually well preserved. Which means one other thing, the fossils aren't the history of life on Earth, they're just the record of where things are dead and have been buried quickly. Now all along this beach, the waves have smashed and sifted and sorted uh, all the different sorts of rocks. And I'm just trying to find one that will help us understand one more thing about the limestone bed that's here. You know, the limestone that we crush up and we cook and we sell it to you and we make cement out of it. Uh, the limb, the glue for the rocks, for the castles, for the walls, all these sort of things. Uh, and when you look at these shells, yes, the shells are actually what make the limestone because they're made of calcium carbonate. And uh, the question is, the trees were washed in. What about the shells? What's interesting about the limestone here is it's red. It's actually got iron in it. But there's also shells. Uh, in fact, the shells are made of calcium carbonate, which is what provides the glue that holds even the limestone together. But the shells are a dead giveaway to two things. One is, if you wander out into the ocean on the edge of the beach, you'll see there's heaps of different shell types, even when they get washed in after a storm. And in the rocks, the limestones around here, there's very few shells, different sorts that is. This is not a buried environment. These have all been washed in. And you know what the dead giveaway for that is? Have a look after a storm, see the pile of shells on the beach, notice that their curves are mostly facing the top. That's because they behave like aeroplane wings. The water washes them in and always tips them up 
so the least arid the most aerodynamic side faces the top so this is not a buried environment this didn't happen slowly this happened quickly this is another washed in deposit now you're thinking the fossil trees a massive flood deposit the fossil shells are flooded in deposit but here's a real eye-opener for you I've led field trips in Nova Scotia, in Tennessee. I can take you to these same rocks. These rocks cover more than half the surface of the earth. Now, that's mind-blowing. Flood deposits of the same order, the same types, the same trees, rapidly bury, no evidence of evolution over more than half the planet. We are being lied to, folks. It's not the evidence that contradicts the biblical account of creation, Noah's flood. It's the opinions of men who weren't there. This brings us to the last secret that can be revealed by this site. I mean, the television, the media, full of an atheistic view of the world, tell you everything could happen all by itself, and yet you know one thing. Look at this construction. Nobody on the planet, no atheist, no pagan, no Christian, no anybody believes all of these stones arrange themselves by accident. You see, the commonest lie around is, creation is just something that's religious you believe it no creation is what people do all the time we make walls that don't happen by themselves we bake Christmas cakes we, we, we make motor cars in fact if you want a good definition of a creation it's anything that can't happen by itself now time and chance destroys that's why this harbor is a mess you want to fix it up you'll have to come here and use your intelligent design your creativity your brains to do it so, second principle, a creation is anything where the end product, these walls, have properties that don't come from the stones itself. And therein lies the whole truth. Even your DNA shows that property. Oh, I know, the National Geographic, the high school curriculum, DNA is a code that evolved over millions of years. In reality, it's got the same properties as this wall. It's made of carbon and nitrogen and hydrogen. It's the world's best known and most sophisticated code. But here's the interesting thing. Stones don't make walls and carbon and nitrogen and hydrogen don't make code at all. Not in you or in the original formation of DNA. DNA shows all the properties of A being able to produce its own kind, which is why our fossils have never evolved. And secondly, it's made of stuff that could never evolve into a code all by itself. Make sure you give God the Creator the credit that's actually due to His name. Next week, we return to our Church Survival Guide series with part three, where Pastor David Nathan and Johnny Kane move on to what is a spiritual Christian, and that's not to be missed. That's right. Well, before we finish, I'd just like to thank those of you who have asked how they can get a GV 24-7 t-shirt. Now, if you would like one and you haven't already been in touch, just drop us a note by clicking contact us saying what size and what country you're in so that we can get an idea of the demand. Now, don't mm. worry, you're not committing to buy one. It's just a guideline for us. Mm. On a slightly more serious note, we've had people contact us about discipleship and problems with churches who are not discipling. Yeah. At this time, we encourage you to ask your pastors to contact us if they'd like support or encourage them to view the discussions with Pastor David Nathan and Johnny Kane. And of course, we do have the Lamplight Project, which comes with a free interactive study guide that connects to hundreds of films on gb247.tv. So do keep in touch with us as we look to develop um, help for yeah. people yeah. in this situation. Mm -hmm. Very important. It is. And we've also been asked to help where false doctrines have entered mainstream evangelical churches, which state that there is no need for repentance, mm -hmm. nor do believers need to ask for forgiveness. They just need to believe in Jesus. Stuart, what does the Bible say? Well, there are numerous scriptures that would reject those statements as utterly false doctrines. Can you imagine somebody telling you that uh, to do this weekend show, we don't need cameras, we don't need lights, we don't need microphones. In fact, we don't need to be here either. Mm. It's that ridiculous. 
Um, repentance is required and the fruit of repentance should be evident. Uh, we see that in Matthew 3, 8, but there are many other scriptures. Confession and forgiveness is required, and this is clearly laid out in Scripture. Certainly a reading of the first letter of John will keep you right on that matter. Once again, we do plan, should the Lord tarry, to meet these challenges head on in the new year. We're here to help. So once again, please do keep in touch with us. You only need to click the contact link below. As we have many viewers worldwide, please do write in to tell us what you would find helpful, yeah. whether you're investigating the claims of the Bible or you just want advice on sound doctrine and biblical practices. And remember, it may already be in one of the channels um, across this network. We've got 22, 23 channels now, yeah. actually. And for those the of you... The Dinosaur Channel. <sighs> including the Dinosaur Channel, is, is a good one. But for those of you without fellowship, our sister ministry, the Sheepfold Church, may be what you're looking for. Mm. So you would go to www.thesheepfold.church. And it's really important that when you read that first page, it urges you to pray about whether to join or not, rather than waste any time. So, any wise words from you, Stuart? Well, with the Christmas season coming, Christmas DVD delivery. Look, that's that's mine. I thought we were going, weren't going to use the Christmas <laughs> word. The nativity season's coming. The reason for the season, Jesus Christ is coming. And concerning DVD delivery, if you are looking to purchase any of our DVDs, mm. particularly as gifts to be sent to people, please do think about putting your order in within the coming days. The it next does, few days. Yeah, it does yeah. make things yeah. easier for us and in regard to any postal delays. Yeah. Please support us. Support us. Tell somebody today, particularly with the Nativity Prophecy Show coming up next yeah. month, because that's going to be a cracker, because yeah. we're not just looking at his birth and death and resurrection, but also his return. It's yeah. part of the whole story. So if you feel it's the right thing to do, become a rep for your church or your city. Pray first, of course, and then yeah. click the contact link and let us know you're interested. Now, we're also on Facebook at Global Vision 247. It's all one word. Please do like and share as you'll get our updates first there. And follow us on Twitter at GV247. Um, and remember, please subscribe if you would like to become part of the GV247 family. We are not doing this for ourselves. It's You've no idea. We're doing this because we believe the Lord's called us to do it. We're here to serve you. Yeah. So... That's it, Lord yeah. willing. We'll and see you remember, next week. We have the GV247 cards. If mm -hmm. you'd like these, these are a great way of just handing to people. Mm -hmm. Great outreach. Um, has the Q code on the back. QR code. QR uh -huh. code. And mm -hmm. people can run their phones over, go straight to the website. And we're going to be adding a whole load of new films. New channels as well next yep. year. In the, well, in the coming weeks, actually, we're mm -hmm. going to be uploading several hundred films in studio interviews on a wide range of topics uh, from some new speakers that we've been interviewing. So Amazing. lots to come. Some really good interviews is, too. Yeah. I, I, you know, you will enjoy it. It's just we're a small team and uh, it takes a while to do all these things, but they're there ready and waiting. Our new channels next year, we've got Christianity 101, Christianity for Beginners. We'll have the, the, the Bethel Women and we'll have Philosophy. Um, there was something else as well, but please write and let us know what it is you need to know more about. We know the experts. More than that, we know the Lord. So, Lord willing, we'll see you next week. God bless. Yes. This is GV247.tv a non-profit web TV channel bringing biblical perspective to the world in which you live. A powerful free resource with hundreds of short films on a wide range of Bible topics from experts around the world, plus full-length sermons and programs for teaching and encouragement. Choose from current affairs, signs of the times, a chance to voice your own opinion, and special offers on our full-length feature films, documentaries, and study materials. 
At over four hours in length, The Lamplight Project is a systematic 12-part Bible study series, a powerful teaching tool that begins with the origins of life and takes the viewer on a comprehensive journey packed with high-profile interviews, film, graphics and illustrations, concluding with the return of Christ and an encouragement to stand firm and be faithful. Complete with a free study guide download for both personal and group study, this powerful interactive guide connects to over a thousand programs with expert interviews on GV247.tv, our free service web TV channel. Does My Life Have Meaning? A powerful one-hour presentation produced from the Lamplight Project. With a free copy of the Gospel of Luke, this film is crammed with engaging interviews, film and graphics. A life-challenging film to those searching for answers. As distributors for the Jesus film, we offer this timeless movie based on Luke's Gospel. This clear presentation of the life of Jesus Christ has been viewed worldwide and translated into over 1,200 languages. We provide the film with a free copy of the Gospel of Luke. The Daniel Project is a popular TV documentary that presents an overview of Bible prophecy and an encouragement to read the signs of the times. Hailed as one of the best TV films to be made on the subject, DVD extras feature a heart-to-heart -heart interview about the way of rescue. We've been serving the body of Christ for over 30 years, and if you would like further information, please do not hesitate to get in touch.